was meant for Shane, he said. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> you guys are in for a treat. I might not have a voice by the end of this, but you guys get to hear what little I have left. <clears throat> yeah, last night, how many of you were at the VIP party? I did my best to try to make my way around every table and say hi, talking three hours over loud music. I'm not as young as I was last year, that's all I can say. Thank you. Look, they, they've even got the Archie Bunker old man chair up there for me. <laughs> Songs that old Glenn Miller played. I'm not going to sit, that feels weird. <clears throat> but I am going to hit my throat with spray every few minutes so I can continue on. I don't think we officially start for, oh no, we did, we're a minute late, sorry. Let's just wrap up though, I'm sorry. I'm a failure already. I want to thank everybody for coming out. How many of you guys have been to the New Jersey Perry Unity Conference before? Nice. How many of you are brand new? Wow, very cool. My name is Dave Schrader. I am the host of the Paranormal 60 podcast. Thank you. All five of you, I appreciate you listening. As a matter of fact, I would like you to do me a favor. If you have a podcast application and you are not yet a subscriber, it's free to subscribe. If you could go look up the Paranormal 60, 60. Doesn't mean that's because I'm 60 years old. It is supposed to be a 60 minute podcast, but because I love you people, it never is. It never is. It's usually the Paranormal 90-ish. I am a, we call it the director's cut. Um, so uh, we have a lot of fun. It's the Paranormal 60. You can watch us live Monday and Wednesday nights on YouTube. Otherwise, all the episodes live there in perpetuity. So you can go find them. We have 189 episodes. We are about a month and a half away from our 200th episode. So I hope you guys will tune in and check them out. Thank you. I am also uh, the lead investigator of the Curse of Lizzie Borden special, the Holzer Files TV series. <laughs> so let me answer a few of the big questions. No, there's no more Holzer Files coming. Sorry. I know. I've just gotten so huge an ego, I can't do it. Uh, no, we, I think they missed the gap. They should have called us Holzer's Ghost Files, and I think we would have been found quicker by more people. We're on a network with Ghost Brothers, Ghost Nation, Ghost Adventures, Ghost Hunters, Kindred Spirits, Destination Fear, Dead Files, the Holzer Files. And then it's just a picture of my sorry ass in a leather jacket, sitting in shame. We kind of look like this 1970s disco era mod squad detective TV series. And they never thought to put a fucking ghost in the picture with us. So. Most viewers are kind of lazy. You're like, oh, what should we watch? I like paranormal. What choice do we have? Oh, oh, ghost, 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 ghost. What's a Holzer? Right? And I also love when you guys write to me and you're like, there should be more Holzer files, but yet you spell the name wrong every time. And then wonder why there's not more Holzer files. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I will field questions. I'd love to hear what you guys have to, uh, to ask. I will also mix in some creepy good stories as we go along uh, and tell you some of the, uh, the strange things that we've had a chance to see over the years. I just came back from Napanock, New York the last week. And well, just one of you. <laughs> now we know where the person from New York is sitting. New Jersey is not happy you're here, sorry. Uh, have you guys been to the Shanley Hotel? Yeah, amazing place. And uh, we had some really wicked, crazy DVP. Uh, had some strange occurrences take place, so if you haven't had a chance, you're lucky. I'm gonna be going back in April with Scotty the Medium. So if you follow my podcast, you'll be able to find out where you get tickets and come see me and ghost hunt with me at the Shannon Hotel. Um, always, yeah, always fun. I know people always wanna know what's like my favorite haunted location I've ever been to, right? I can't choose one. I, it's impossible. I can tell you my least favorite haunted place was a Hooters in Chicago. <laughs> you could laugh, it was a Hooters in Chicago. And uh, it just was so, I felt so icky the whole time. Because I'm like, you know, as the girl's talking to me down in the basement, where all the weird activity takes place, and none of the, the Hooters waitresses like to go down in the basement, 
and she's down there talking to me and she's super edgy and nervous and they're bringing girl after girl downstairs into the basement with me. It just felt real sketchy. <laughs> Especially when they came back with their hair all messed up, <laughs> shirt untucked. And we were just, it was poltergeist activity. It was crazy in the basement. Uh, yeah, but that was probably the least favorite. I, I love haunted locations. I have no problem going into uh, a good paranormal location, a hotspot. Because, like you, I'm driven by the concept of what comes next. And can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I feel like my voice is getting quieter and quieter. <laughs> By the end of this, I'm gonna sound like Jigsaw from a song, please. You're all in an auditorium. Let's play a game. Oh, well, that was more Optimus Prime than anything, else. not it? Autobots, roll out. Uh, I'm not afraid when we go into these locations because I'm going there looking for ghosts. So many of you ask, aren't you afraid? No. Are you afraid when you go to the zoo and see bears and monkeys and chipmunks? We have a very lame zoo in Minnesota, so that's, that's all we could afford there. So I'm not frightened. No, I, I always tell people if I'm sitting in my living room in my underwear watching The Bachelor and a ghost walks in, I would poop just like you would. But I'm not expecting it there, right? Uh, I, I love when I've gone to haunted locations and we've done, we used to do these huge conferences We'd have two to three hundred people, and it'd be like the Ghost Hunters or Ghost Adventures crew and a couple other special guests. And we'd be at the Queen Mary or Eastern State Penitentiary or the Stanley Hotel. And at night, I'd go walking around from location to location as everybody was out ghost hunting. And there, there was this woman sitting in the hall, really cute girl, crying and shaking. I'm like, What's wrong? She's like, The water keeps going on in my bathroom by itself. I'm like, That's awesome. She goes, no, it's not, it's terrifying. I go, it's water. Why are you afraid? And she's like, I just, this is scary, it's in my room. I go, are you part of our paranormal conference? She goes, yeah, my boyfriend's out ghost hunting right now, and I just wanted to relax in the room. I go, but you came to have paranormal experiences. Not in my room. <laughs> so I said, well, let's go to your room and see what happens. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I ended up with 11 children. <laughs> Mystery solved. Uh, so we went in and we sat on the edge of her bed. And she's just sitting there. There's nothing happening. And all of a sudden I hear, Shh. And I go look in the bathroom. The water turned on, so I fucking left. That's weird. <laughs> Who's got time for that shit, right? Ooh. She started crying, she's weirded out. So, and then, of course, all of a sudden the door opens up and it's the boyfriend. And I'm in the room and he's looking at his girlfriend sitting on the end of the bed and I'm standing by the bathroom and he's like, what's going on? And I go, your water keeps turning on by itself. She was out in the hall crying. So I came in to see the water turn on for itself. You're not buying any of this. <laughs> and then the water turned back on and he goes, what the fuck? <laughs> so I said, it's just water. Don't worry about it. If you guys, you know, if you guys are weirded out really later on, here's my room number. Come knock on the door and I'll help you find another room. We'll, we'll go talk to the front desk staff. And two hours later, boom, 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 they're on my door. And I'm like, yeah, what's going on? They're like, can't sleep, dude. The water keeps turning on. Now our TV keeps turning on. We just want to get out of that room. And then they just stood there and stared at me. I mean, I was just in my underwear, which is weird. They said, all right. I got ready. We went up and got them into a different room. They were out of that room in 30 minutes. So don't go to a paranormal conference and not expect paranormal shit to happen, right? That's the moral of the story. Or the other moral is, if you're out in the hallway crying and you're a pretty girl, I'm probably taking you to your room. <laughs> I'm a giver. It's what I do. Uh, being out and about, my other favorite one was my very first event I did that I hosted was in Warwick, Rhode Island, uh, the home of TAPS headquarters. And Steve Gonzalez and Paula Donovan were my two celebrity guests. And the entire cast and crew showed up to sign autographs for the fans. And we were at this like Fairfield Inn, and they
they had two haunted rooms. So they're like, we'll open those up so you can investigate. And I think in our first event, we had 60 people. So we had 30 in each room. <laughs> 30 people standing asses to elbows in the haunted room, right? But what's cool is halfway through the event, this guy comes down. And he's rubbing his throat. And he's just kind of standing there murmuring to himself. And I walk over and I go, is everything OK? And he goes, I don't know, man. I went into that room upstairs. And I felt like I was choking. I felt like I was almost gurgling something. Like, that's weird. And I go, are you OK? Maybe you're having an allergic reaction. He goes, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And I said, all right, we'll just sit down and relax for a little bit. About 15 minutes later, another guy comes down doing the same exact thing. One guy's got his back to him, so he doesn't see it. So I walk over and I start asking him what's going on. And I go, that guy had the same problem. So I get the guy over it and he start sharing notes. The desk clerk is listening. And he goes, guys, come here. I was working here the night this happened. In that room, a gentleman slit his own throat. And then panicked and called, hoping for help. And I was the one that got the call. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. I just heard this gurgling noises, and then the phone dropped. And I sent the police. And he unfortunately passed away in that room. And these two guys' eyes are huge. And then come their wives. And they're like, what's going on? Why are you down here? And I'm like, this is incredible. These two guys, not together, different groups, both had this experience of being choked to death in a room where a man slit his own throat and died choking on his own blood. What the fuck? You didn't even want to come to this trip. This was my trip. Right? Mine too. Oh my God. So you get to have a paranormal experience and get to go to Vegas this year and have fun. Oh. And I go, wait a minute. Your husbands felt like they were choking to death. Yeah, well, why couldn't that happen to us? And I said, well, you keep that attitude up. Right? <laughs> a self-fulfilling prophecy might be coming your way, darling. They were so pissed off, so I love when the skeptics come. And these guys had no interest in the paranormal. They were literally there to be supportive of their wife, which is awesome. And then they walked away with the experience, and I don't think they probably ever lived it down. Although I did mention that story on the radio a couple years ago, and that was God, 15 years, 16 years ago that that happened. And the wife is still listening to my podcast, and she's like, I was one of those assholes. <laughs> Great, and she goes, and now he's got all the equipment and he's out and swimming every weekend. And I'm home with the kids. What a dick. Nice day. It's a yeah, right, thanks, Dave. I'm the new Obama. Thanks, Obama. Dave Schrader. Breaking paranormal hearts, right? Uh, are there any questions specifically you'd like to know? No? Great, have a good day. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hot chicks in hallways crying. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I wish I had a cool story, like I was bitten by a radioactive psychic or something. Bonked my head, woke up with abilities. I just have always had the paranormal around me ever since I was a kid. My grandmother used to visit me after she passed away. Um, we lived in a haunted house in Medina, Illinois, growing up. Nothing scary, just footsteps and voices. Uh, and you know, my mom and dad never made it weird, so it was never taboo in our family. So we just kind of, it, it is what it is. And uh, things just work out. But I will tell you, let me give you a quick little life lesson. How many of you are where you want to be in life? Show me with a raise of hands. Lie and sex and shit. <laughs> you want to be in a Hooters in Chicago, don't lie to me. In the basement, that's right. Uh, this is something, honest to God, true. Believe in the power of intention. If there's anything about the paranormal I've learned over the years is that the power of intention is so extremely powerful. When I was seven years old, living in Chicago, I used to take my little black tape recorder, my little Kmart blank cassettes, and I'd practice being a radio host in the garage, right? I'd be like, hey, you're listening to WLS, and this is Dave the Wave with Katrina and the Waves walking on sunshine, right? And I would introduce them, and I would read Hardy Boy stories and try to make them all dramatic and cool. And uh, that was it. And I wanted to be, I was hooked. I wanted to be a radio host from that age on. And I used to call all the big radio jocks in, in Chicago and interview them. 
just talking to them. And some of them would call me back, and it would always freak my mom and dad out. But I'd hear, uh, Dave? Yeah? Larry and Lou Jack's on the phone for you? And he's like our big morning show jock. And I'm like, oh, cool. Hey, Mr. Lou Jack. And he talked to me for an hour about being a DJ. And it was so cool. And then I went off to Winona State. I was a young man, 20 years old. I had been out of high school for a couple years. I had no direction. I decided I was going to be a college student and figure out my direction. And I like literally made the decision they told me, you got to come take the SATs, you got to come do all this stuff. I'm like, okay. So I had just enough money to get me to Winona and back. Because I lived in Chicago, Winona, Minnesota is where I was going to go to school. So I drove as I get there, or most of the way there, and my car started sputtering. And I had a 1969 Plymouth Fury 3. It's a tank. My car could drive over all your cars. <laughs> And I wouldn't even know it. It was a cool car, but it starts. So I take the exit and I pull off into a rest area. And I'm standing there because I know nothing about cars. I know you look at me and you think, that's one manly guy. I am a manly man that knows nothing about cars. And I'm just standing there as a man does with the hood open, staring at the engine. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I don't, I, I gotta be in school in eight hours to do this test. And I'm just stressing, right? And all of a sudden, out of the woods, walks hippie Jesus. Long hair, pointy beard, blue jeans, no socks, no shirt, no shoes, but he serviced me. Wait a minute, that came out wrong. So he comes walking out of the woods. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. Driving. Pop, pop, pop. Oh, I know what it needs. That's how good my description was. So he looks at my car and he goes, oh, you need a gazillion plats for your car. Because I don't know any words of what things are under my hood. And, and he goes over and he gets this old rusted toolbox out of his beat up Nova. And he comes over and he opens it up. There's a little plastic bag, and in it is wrapped this little rubbery cap thing. And he goes, what are the odds that I have one? And I'm like, that's pretty cool. And he goes, how much do you think this is worth? I'm not gay, but 20 bucks is 20 bucks. So I'm like, and I start panicking, and I just look at him and I go, I'm not going to try to take a test to get entrance to college. I have spent every dollar I have to get here, and the money I have is just enough to take my test, eat lunch, and drive back home. I don't have any more money. And he goes, we can work it out in other ways. <laughs> okay. So he fixed it for me, and he told me how to pump the water in the well to put the cold water in my radiator. So I did it. And then he goes, this is what you're going to do for me, man. You're going to be nice to somebody else. Fuck that, right? I drove off. Fuck you, hippie. Uh, and I was like, all right. So that's been a big lesson for me. So I drive to college, take my test. I get in there, and I'm panicking. It's been three years since high school, right? Three years since high school. And I suck at math. And I'm sitting in the lobby, and there's this young guy sitting there. And they, oh, are you here for the test? I'm like, yeah. I'm really nervous. He goes, why? I go, I think I can do all the rest, but I haven't studied. And I, I suck at math. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's a tough part. And we have this great conversation. He goes, well, why are you, why'd you wait three years? Oh, my life just took a turn, man. I got I to gotta figure out a pathway. And all of a sudden, the clock ticks, and it's time for the test. And all the people are milling around in the lobby. And this guy walks up and opens the door and lets me in and lets all of us in. And he's the instructor. And then with the test, you have A, B tests, so you're not sitting next to somebody with the same test. So we get each one of the science tests, English test, this test, that. Last one is the math test. And he comes over, and hand to God, I swear, I, this is not meant to be racist at all. I'm sitting next to an Asian girl, and he gives her the math test, and he goes, oh, I only have one more math test, but it's the same as hers. I can trust you not to cheat, right? <laughs> Sets the thing down, he looks at the clutch, he goes, 
all right, you have 50 minutes to complete the test. I have to go make a call. And he looks right at me and he goes, I'll be back in 50 minutes. <laughs> Nobody cheat. And then he leaves. And I cheat like a monkey. <laughs> Saddest thing is, I sat next to the stupidest Asian <laughs> ever to walk the face. We, we passed by one point, but good enough to get me into college. So that was my second miracle of the day, right? I go to college. I'm in there. I'm just not, I'm not in, but let me just give you guys this quick preface. If you go to the VIP parties or you see any of the celebrities hanging around, they're usually in our little packs. It's not because we're standoffish or we're better than you. I mean, we are, but <laughs> most of us in this field are introverts in an extrovert world, right? Just like most of you are probably introverts, right? So, a lot of times we look standoffish or kind of like, oh, they're so arrogant, they won't even talk. Come talk to us and we're fine. We're not always great about making that first step. If you come to the VIP party, you will see I'm one of the few that makes my rounds. It's horrifying to me to do that because so many of you smell so <laughs> No, it's horrifying, it's really hard to do, but I go do it, push past that. But a lot of people have trouble, so please be patient with the people that can at our conferences. They're not always the easiest uh, uh, to talk to because they don't, they, they, it's really hard for us. Anyway, so that's my life. I was an introvert. I'm trying to find my spray. There it is. Um, one second. <clears throat> oh, this is better. <laughs> so I went to college. I wouldn't leave my house except for to go to classes. And finally, my roommates are like, Schrader. Go meet people, get out of the house. So I got up, went outside, and a cute blonde in 80s short shorts and a ponytail walked by. So I followed her across campus because it wasn't stalking then, it was just being creepy, right? I followed her to the Performing Arts Center. I'm like, I like performing arts. See, there's all these tryouts for school plays. I like school plays. She just keeps walking. There's the band practice, there's the orchestral practice. There's the vocal practice. She walks up the stairs, I follow her down the hall, and then she goes into the last door on the left, which sounds like a horror movie. And I walk down, and there it is. KQAL, 89.5, your radio alternative, now seeking radio personalities. The choir inside. And I walk inside, and there's all these guys, and they introduce themselves, and they talk to me, yeah, you can start tomorrow, we'll start training tomorrow. I'm like, awesome. Hey, out of curiosity, who's the blonde that came in just before me? And they all looked at each other, and then looked back at me, and they're like, look at us. If there was a cute blonde with a ponytail, do you think we'd be talking to you? <laughs> Fair enough. I'm like, seriously, did she come and go to a back door? There is no back door. Right? Intention brought me there, I believe. Well, a blonde like you'd ask brought me. <laughs> but I think I set that intention years in the past. So intention manifestation is really important in your lives. And I've heard you guys say stuff when you're at my table and you're meeting me at the bars or at the, the uh, uh, VIP parties. Stop putting yourselves down. Stop hurting yourselves. Be kind to yourselves. Set your intention to have a good life and you'll have a good life. I am a lucky, lucky man who has manifested an incredible life that I'm so happy and proud of. And it's not because I got magic, it's not because I got money, it's because I just want to have a good life. And I keep finding cool things to do. And not only did I get to do radio, but I got to marry it with my passion for paranormal. And I got to travel the world and see amazing places and meet people like you, which makes up for not much, but I still get to meet people. I'm kidding. So I get to meet you, I get to go out and investigate, I get to hear history, I got to be on TV, I'm friends with all these amazing uh, paranormal personalities. So please, if anything you can take away from talking and meeting with me is believe in yourself and your destiny. And for those of you that think, yeah, well, I wanted to be that. It took me, I was seven years old, it took me until I was 40 before I got to do radio, radio. So it takes a while. Doesn't always mean it's overnight, but if it's a dream and a passion, and you keep following and keep putting it out to the universe, it's remarkable how things come together, right? All right, somebody else had a quick question. Yes. I wanna know what extra files and how the episodes were chosen, the stories. 
she wants to know how the holes are filed and episodes were chosen. Um, well, he had thousands of files, so they started calling about a year before we even launched production because a lot of his stuff was of purpose, which we can't do for TV. Uh, so those were eliminated. We went to some of the big places right away. We went to some of the places that invaded Dr. Holzer right away. Places he wanted to go but he couldn't get into at the time. So we, we had a good base to start with. That's how it happened. And then they saw season one, and then places reached out to us that were like, you know, Dr. Holzer came here, my mom turned him away. But now that we see how you treat the ghosts in the history, we'd like to invite you in. And that's how it happened. So we got two great seasons, a lot of fun. I got a chance to meet Shane and Cindy and work with them. Now Cindy is on... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, Cindy is now on the Dead Files. And if you haven't had a chance to watch it with Cindy, please watch it and support her. Support the shows that you love. And I'm gonna give you guys another quick little uh, bit. If you love a TV show, and you love to binge watch them when they're done, you're killing your favorite TV shows. You have to watch that show in the first 24 to 48 hours to have the ratings matter. But I'm only one person. That's what a million of you think, and that's why shows like Holzer Files gets canceled. You all loved it, and you all binge watched it after it ended. Unfortunately, that doesn't save the show. So, I don't have time, but I still want to binge watch. What can I do? Record it, turn it on while you're doing your laundry, you're mowing the lawn, you're whatever. Let it just run in the background, and then binge watch them all in a row afterwards, but let them all air within the first 24 to 48 hours so that it counts towards the ratings, and you will see more of your favorite shows stay on longer. That's just something they don't teach you, but would be very helpful to know, right? So now you know. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yes, who else had a question? Yes. Is there anywhere you wouldn't investigate? Ah, uh, Hooters in Chicago. <laughs> yes, if there's any place I would not investigate. I wouldn't investigate Amityville. Uh, I believe that the haunting went with the Lutz family. I believe it started with the Lutz family, and I think it ended with the Lutz family. I'm not saying they were fakes or frauds at all. I believe that they had paranormal activity. <clears throat> Becoming good friends with Chris Lutz, the youngest boy, uh, I believe it was more torment from things that the family did that they didn't realize the damage they were doing. George was in the transcendental meditation and he was calling out other spirits. I guess in transcendental <coughs> meditation, you call on spirits to help him. He was calling other spirits in that he thought would make him powerful. And, and he had Chris and Danny doing it with him. So we think that that might have been more of what they were dealing with. Um, that's a really surreal moment too. Like I said, my parents were very cool about the paranormal. They never made it weird or taboo. And my, uh, I remember seeing the Jay Hansen novel on the counter. And I went over and picked it up and I go, Mom, can I read this? She's like, no, this is too scary for you. And then 30 years later, I introduced her to Chris Lutz, my buddy. And I'm like, Mom, this is the youngest boy from the end of the horror. The book you wouldn't let me read because it was too scary. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Belanger and I did a little sizzle reel for a TV show years ago. It was in Long Island. And we drove over to drive to see the Amityville house. And we went and we took pictures in front of it. So when I had Chris Lutz out in Chicago at a paranormal conference, I put him in my car and I drove him to my childhood home and I made him stand in front of my house and take pictures. I thought it was only fair. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of paranormal locations I'd like to get to. Um, I really would love to go to the White House. I don't mean to visit, I want to be president. Dave Schrader, 2024. Right? I will kick the ghosts out of the White House for you. Um, yeah, I would love to go to the White House. I would love to just see some famous historic sites, places that uh, have rich history and, and go in. But I, you know, I still have families from time to time when, when needed. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I'm sure there's something I'm just blanking out on. Uh, the Mount Washington would be one I'd like to get to. Um, uh, Malvern Manor in Iowa. 
the list of Max Murder House. Uh, there's, yeah, there's so many cool places I'd love to get to still. You know some places in New York? Are they your place? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Lady, I have 11 kids. What about protection do you think I know? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm very much into prayer. That's my, my thing. I'm, I was brought up Lutheran, and I, I don't go to church. I just have a relationship with God and Jesus. We call each other every Wednesday. And, uh, no, that's my, my gig. I just do prayers. Uh, prayers for me, prayers for locations. What was really nice is on Holzer Files, they allowed us to do prayer and stuff. We, I know a lot of you think, well, how can we never help the family or the home or the ghosts? We do, they don't always show up. Because there are a lot of people that get upset watching Christians pray, and it pisses them off. So we don't do it. But we try to work in other religions and belief systems too. Like when we were at the Morris Jumel Mansion in New York, which was amazing, we had the Santeria priest come out and do a clearing and cleansing. Um, I became the de facto priest on the Ghosts of Devil's Perch. Uh, they let me do prayers at every location and they filmed them all and made like half the episodes. You see me doing my, my deal. I, I'm all about trying to help the spirits. And let me also clarify, when I'm doing the prayer, I'm not saying I'm carrying the spirits. My suffering strokers are getting darker. <laughs> oh shit, how did he go? On stage. Most of the way In front of you is an overweight bald radio host. He has the only key out and it's in his stomach along with four pounds of tasty donuts. <laughs> All right. Yes. The most haunted place I've ever done? Impossible. I can't tell you. There's some Rolling Hills Asylum up in East Bethany, New York. is bonkers. I just came back from the Shanley Hotel in Napa. That was crazy. Uh, Eastern State Penitentiary, the Stanley, Queen Mary, Waverly Hills uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. There's so many places that are just nutty. And then there's times you go in, like I've been to Bobby Mackey's when it's crazy, and I've been to Bobby Mackey's when it's nothing, you know? I, first time I went to Bobby Mackey's with the Ghost Adventures crew, freezing. Zach's like, what the hell is wrong? I said, I gotta take the blame for that. And he goes, why? I said, because I always said it'd be a cold day in hell before you'd find me in a country bar. <laughs> Manifestation, intention, completion. Yes. Not in New Jersey. There's no haunted places. <laughs> you guys lead such a clean, reverent lifestyle in Jersey. I've seen Snooky in the situation. Uh, I'm not from this area, so I can't answer you. Um, raise your hands if you know of cool places in the area. Lady, look at these people with their hands up and avoid them. They're crazy, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there are. Uh, I would love to. I would love to investigate the Stone Pony. I don't know if it's haunted, but I gotta guess it is, right? So many music halls and places are. Yes. Question: Have you ever had an attachment follow you home? Uh, yes, eleven of them from the hospital. <laughs> They're still sucking at the teeth of my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm not psychic, so when I'm at Napanok at the Shanley and I'm communicating with this ghost, and then I go home and something weird happens, I can't turn around and go, oh, it's the ghost from the Shanley. I don't know where it's from, but I always say this, a haunted location is like a giant magnet, which it is, electromagnetic field, right? Active. You take a paper clip, it is not magnetized, but if I go rub it on that magnet for a few minutes and I take it over to the other paper clips I can daisy chain four or five of them because it's now magnetized. So I kind of feel like once you've been in the ick of a paranormal place and you go other places, you're still icky and things will come to you, but they usually fade pretty quick. I've <coughs> thankfully never had anything negative or bad. I really have had some weird creepy stuff um, that have popped up from 
rare to live, but I, you know, I'm friends with John Zaffis. I just don't know. <laughs> you knock it off, I'm calling John Zaffis. Um, so before I, in the house I'm living now, we're renting another house a block and a half away. And uh, the kids are spread out throughout the entire house. And our youngest was in the one room, and he did not like it because of a man in his closet that would look out at him and the laughing guy under his bed. So he moved to the basement to sleep with his brothers in a huge room, and I took that over as my radio studio, and I would do my shows from there. And when we bought the house a block and a half away, we cleared out the entire house except for my studio. It was the last night, and I was doing my broadcast from there live, and I say my good nights at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I hang up my headphones and turn off my microphone, and I hear the front door slam, and I hear somebody walking around at 2 in the morning. So I go home. Is somebody over here? She goes, no, dummy, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Please sound asleep. Right? I'm like, uh, okay. Now, being the man, the strong, virile, strong man you see before you, I did what any man would do when his house is in trouble. I hid in the closet and called 911. <laughs> That's where my tax dollars are going. I'm going to make those fuckers work for it, right? <laughs> So I hid in the closet, called the cops, the cops showed up, I gave them the passcode, they're like, I said, I think the front door's open, I just come through the front door, he goes, no, we'll come in through the garage, what's the passcode? I'm like, yeah, I heard the front door open and shut, I think it's open, just come in through the, no, we'll come in through the garage, what's the passcode? 666. Six, six. <laughs> up goes the garage. I hear them walking around the house, calling out. And then the doo 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 on the bedroom door. So I quickly stepped out of the closet. Yeah, come on in. Well, Mr. Schrader, we did a complete thorough walk around. There's nobody in your house. The windows and doors are all locked from the inside. Uh, are you sure you heard something? I'm like, yeah, I'm positive I heard something. And there, the one cop, she's about this tall. And she's standing there all kind of Barney Fife with her big bulletproof vest on. She's got her thumbs hitched in it. She's like, are you sure that's what it, you experienced? And her, her partner's like six foot four, right? Intimidating looking guy, and they're just scorning me. You could just say, oh, you're an idiot, sir, right? We have so many better things to do. And all of a sudden, downstairs, and they both go, stay here. <laughs> they take out their guns, and I went back in the closet. <laughs> Because I am an international TV sensation, I'm saving myself for you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So the cops come back up, and they come back in the room, and their eyes are huge. And they're like, let's just go. We're going to go. Well, you can back up in the morning, you know. We're good. Let's go. Let's pull out of here. And I'm like, what did you find? And they're like, there was nothing. I, we heard footsteps. I know. We heard them walking around us. Let's go! We have guns! Fucking get out of your house, man! <laughs> so I, I left the house, and the cops were efficiently freaked out by my experience. So that was cool. um, but I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it's just the creepy-ass ghost that we had. I don't know. It was a fun deal, but I can't say that it was attached to me. I don't know where it came from. I mean, you'd want to hang out with me. Why wouldn't a dead guy, right? <laughs> yes. No, that's not true. He had paranormal experiences. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to remember the whole, did Hans Holzer ever see a ghost? I can't remember if he saw one, but he, he believed and relied heavily on the mediums that he worked with, and he heavily believed in the supernatural and paranormal. Uh, he was also a practicing witch. He wrote books on UFOs, aliens, psychic phenomena, ghosts. He wrote over 145 books. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if he ever saw those, but he definitely believed in them. And he knew that he was communicating with them through the trans mediums that he worked with. So that's about all I know. I, I got to do the very final interview of Hans Holzer's life. Uh, I did a radio interview with him uh, about a year before he passed away. So that was real. I had him and his daughter Alexandra on the same show, so she was the first hour, he was the second hour. She was coming out with her first book, his last book. So I got a really cool chance to interview them both, and uh, that's kind of how I ended up on the Holzer Files. Any other quick questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for coming. 
My pleasure. No, our cameramen were great. They never left, uh, but they would get weirded out all the time. Uh, when we were in a house, I want to say it was in New York. Uh, I can't remember which one, but uh, we were up on this second floor area, and the camera guy's standing there with his back to one of the haunted rooms, and I'm standing outside the room explaining what's going on, and all of a sudden, very clearly, we hear walking up behind him. And he's got the big camera on his shoulder, and all of a sudden he goes. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were really good. Like, if you watch Devil's Perch, how many of you guys saw Ghost of the Devil's Perch? Thank you. Um, the Cabbage Patch episode, when I got put down to the ground. Cameramen are supposed to be like wildlife photographers. They just have to film the gazelle being eaten by the lion. So when I go down, their job is not to save me. Their job is to get ratings and kill me on screen, right? Because you all would have fucking turned in, you ghouls. Uh, but when we're doing it, I wish I, I should play the recording someday. I've got it. It's a 15-minute recording of Cindy. And she is cursing a blue streak of these guys. And you put your cameras down and effing help him. He's effing dying. Look at how effing old and effing fat he is. Somebody help him save him. I'm never going to effing do TV again. Effing, 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 Yet she never ran to my aid to give me uh, a <laughs> pulse or mouth to mouth, you know. But she was worried somebody should. And, uh, but she was great. And then they, they got me out of the building. And... Uh, wanted to put me in an ambulance. This was during COVID still, and Montana is not vaxxers or maskers. So they were, every day was news stories about how overflowing their hospitals are. And I thought I was having a heart attack or dying, and I didn't want to go to the hospital, because I'm like, I might get COVID. They're like, you're going to die, dumbass. I'm like, yeah, but not of COVID. Right? I'm not doing that. And. Uh, Cindy comes out, she's yelling at me, and then they called my wife. So I got my work wife in front of me, my home wife on my ear, and they're both getting it. And when a psychic goes, you need to go, you go. She knows things, right? Uh, yeah, so that was it. One more quick question, and then, yes. <laughs> quick answer, so when I first met Shane, they had already uh, brought in Cindy. They hired Cindy, then they hired me, and we went through two other techs before we found Shane. The guys were good, they just, one had an IMDB, he had been in TV and movies, and they didn't want somebody that was an actor because you guys don't like actors on paranormal TV shows, which understandable, but there are a lot of people that are in the field that also love the paranormal. So those two guys didn't get in, and then their last chance was a week before we went to film. They did this thing, they go, Dave, we need you to do this quick chemistry test with a new guy. <coughs> I go, great, let's do this. And they said, we need, can you get like natural light on you? And it was Minnesota in January. <laughs> I'm like, the only natural light I have is in my three seasons porch, and it's known three seasons for a reason, because nobody should be on my porch in winter, right? So I go out and I got all the nice natural light in my black shirt, and, doing a little face on and she goes, Dave Schrader, this is Shane Pittman, Shane Pittman, this is Dave Schrader. I go, hey, dude, how you doing today? He goes, man, I'm freezing my ass off here in Georgia, it's freezing. I'm like, what is it? It's like 58 degrees, man. <laughs> and I just looked at the camera and I go, fuck you. <laughs> and I held the camera up and I showed him my thermometer and the red was dripping out of the bottom. <laughs> and she starts laughing and we just, we had that rapport through it where we just were taking the piss out of each other. And they hired him that day and put him out to work with me. And he's been my little brother ever since. Great guy. Everything you see on TV about Shane is exactly who Shane is. He is a loving, sweet chicken shit. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> he was nervous. He will tell you I worked with him so that he got better when you saw him on 28 Days Haunted. He was leading the pack, man. If you haven't seen 28 Days Haunted yet, it's on uh, Netflix, yeah. Tell John you want to see Shane next year. Get my old ass out of here, bring Shane in, yeah. Um, but Shane's doing well and he's doing the show and just so everybody knows, the whole poor Shane thing, I'm the one that started hashtag poor Shane. 
and now I wish I hadn't. Because everybody thinks I'm a bully and a jerk for always saying, just so you know, we all spent time alone in each one of those haunted rooms. We only show the scenes when something happened. And it just so happened, it happened with Shane. The other thing is, a lot of those places were on the East Coast that were built in like the 1700s. And you people were short back then. And I am a giant man. And when I'm in a basement whose ceiling starts here, you don't want to see this. So Shane can like walk in, he's still got room, even with his spiky hair. So he can get around a lot easier than I can. So that's why they put him in those situations. But there was one moment in season two that I wish they would have kept in. We're standing there, and there's this guy, Bob Mazziello, and he's got these crazy things going on. And I go, Cindy, where do you feel drawn? She goes, I want to go upstairs where Bob woke up and had that thing hovering over him. I'm like, okay. And I go, Shane, in the basement, there's a little child's ghost. I don't like children ghosts. It weirds me out. I don't want to do it. You're going to go to the basement. And he looks at me and he goes, fuck you, you go to the basement. <laughs> and that was our response. We all laughed, right? And uh, I go, oh, it's cute when he thinks he's an adult, right? Um, <laughs> They go, okay, kids, do, do, do that again. And you guys just wonder if there's acting on paranormal TV. This is why there's no acting. Okay, Shane, do it again. All right, Shane, I don't want to go in the basement because of blah, blah, blah. All right, so you're going to go to the basement. No, Dave, you fuck it. You go to the basement, your own self, alone by yourself in the basement. Shane, try that again a little less wordy. Fuck you, Dave. Into the basement, you shall go. No, I'm not saying, just, just calm, all right? Remember it was, fuck you, you go to the basement. Okay. No way, fucking going, I'm not me going in the basement, you go. And then I realized he's pulling these lines on purpose so he could just keep telling me to fuck off. That's the only thing he was doing. But he had a great time, we had a great time. He's a great guy. Support those shows, check out his podcast, The Searchers, uh, Open Mind. That's a great podcast, a lot of fun. Uh, check out my podcast, The Paranormal 60. Uh, you can listen to it wherever you listen to audio podcasts, or you can watch us on YouTube on the Paranormal 60 YouTube channel. I'm going to be at my table all weekend. This is my third year here. I love meeting you guys. If you have questions, I'll see you. Thank you. And a big thank you to the New Jersey Para Unity Expo for having me out again. God bless, and I'll see you hopefully in another year.